there's a reason, actually. It's so that I can sync the video that I have to record separately with the audio so that I can, for the podcast, make the sound a little better. It's a lot to deal with, you guys. Um, so don't complain, okay? Uh, <clears throat> I'm just joshing with you. This is uh, God Word, the podcast. I'm your host, Casey, and we've been making progress through Moby Dick. I think three episodes, this is the fourth. We're going to take a break after this one, but we'll probably circle back. I mean, it's that good. As I've tried to frame it for you, the central problem of the modern period and the central problem in Moby Dick has everything to do with subjective perspective. It has to do, you know, with the question of do things mean anything? Can we have standards of morality and beauty, or are these in the eye of the beholder, and therefore arbitrary? And then, when you understand this level of the problem, you begin to see the subsequent problem of authority. Who decides the answers to these questions, and can authoritative judgments override our own? Let's get right to the hardest and most controversial edge of this. Few things anger you know, modern liberals more than a very candid discussion about personal beauty, because if beauty is real and not arbitrary, then egalitarianism can never be consummated and our utopia will never arrive. There are some um, noses objectively more beautiful than others, it seems to me, but are there? Like, that's what these, these moderns, postmoderns would say to us. Are some eyelids more aesthetically excellent than others? Are so-called cankles on women less beautiful in an objective way than slender ankles? Many of us grew up under an oppressive media blitz that tried to su sort of suggest that beauty was not tied to anything objective. They tried to tell us that, you know, actually... When Rubens painted, fat girls were considered the most beautiful. And, you know, Marilyn Monroe was a size 14 or whatever. This is all flat-out lies, of course, though I expect that some people hearing this will feel sad and maybe even get mad at me. But they wouldn't get mad at this, this what I'm about to say, which is kind of the other end of the spectrum, part of the argument, which was, you know, back in the 1990s when I was growing up, the media was still pushing ultra-skinniness, in women as the ideal. The supermodels of the late 80s and 90s would often be 5'9 and 103 pounds. But here's the thing. What if neither ultra skinny nor ultra fat is a true ideal, but, you know, a true beautiful? Maybe there is a true beauty that people will recognize at a level that even constant media propaganda cannot touch. Think of the famous 7 to 10 waist hip ratio thing. We're talking nature here. So the question is, can an Ahab or some scary Republican dictator or a degenerate liberal commie tyrant force us to see beauty in the way they want us to? They might force us to say, you know, Twiggy is so beautiful. Oh, how great that they put a 200-pounder on the cover of Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Issue. We might say these things. But can an authority get us to think these things? There's a very relevant scene in chapter 21 of the Gospel of Matthew that shows Jesus talking with some chief rabbis. <clears throat> Quote, And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up, sorry, came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where did it come from? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man... We are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. <clears throat> so 
So by what authority did John baptize? What a powerful question. The idea here is that it bothers the institutional authorities, the powers that be, the people that, sorry, it, it bothers them that people should want to seek the accreditation, so to speak, of a John the Baptist. I mean, to them, he's a real outsider. This would be like an you know itinerant, independent scholar show, setting up shop just off the property of a major university and hundreds of bright students showing up to hear him lecture. They go voluntarily, and they love being there. This humiliates the professional professors who often find that their own students fall asleep in class and listen to music out of a you know, not very well concealed headphone. So for this to happen, what is necessary? Well, one thing. The judgment of the students has to be capable of recognizing true authority and not institutional authority. And the difference here is crucial and institutionalists often fail to see its importance. Now, if the institutional authority constantly propagandizes and even starts to put pressure on people who question it or marginalize them, will people still be able to recognize true authority? At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the same terms are used to describe Jesus' speaking. You know, quote, when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowd was amazed by the way he taught. He wasn't like the teachers of the law. Instead, he taught with authority. But remember, Jesus was asked to stop doing this by institutional authority, and he did not, and they killed him for it. The path to knowing truth is difficult, but speaking it can be deadly. This, when I was writing this, reminded <clears throat> me of the one really good essay I ever read by Jacques Derrida called The Mystical Foundation of Authority. In it, he concludes that the notion of, of justice implies power or force. Essentially, the threat of violence is implied in the idea of justice. It's an awesome realization, one that's quite reactionary or real politic in a way that utop utopian liberals can never understand. They want to believe in that, you know, it, that they want to believe that in their utopia, or perhaps, you know, or whatever, that they, the one that they pretend to believe is going to be, I don't know how they work, I don't know how the liberal thinks, but the, what they want to believe is that in their utopia, no one would be forced to comply with anything, right? Because consent is like sort of the whole foundation of their morality. That's false, Derrida shows them. For authority to be authoritative, it needs to threaten anyone who would refuse to recognize it as an authority. So tread careful, gang. Because of this, the so-called black pill comes first. I do believe that, tragically, most people can be made to believe in things that aren't real. And not just say it, you know, in fake beauty, in fake morality, etc. If the institutional authority incentivizes these sorts of opinions enough. And I say this based on personal experience partially. I actually remember a time when I thought like the ultra skinny was the essence of female beauty. And it was a thought I recognized later planted there by the media when I was very young, maybe even like prepubescent, like very young. And, the, and, the, and then the thought of like the very skinny aesthetic sort of colonized my mind until I was maybe 22 or something when I finally began to trust my own you know, eyes. True fema female beauty looks, you know, whatever, like one of those fairies in the Louis Ricardo Falero paintings. <laughs> or uh, whatever, the sculptures of Aphrodite, or like a Paul Talk nude painting. But not every, sorry, but not everyone wakes up so early as I did, you know, 22. I mean, not really wakes up, but you know, you get it, what I'm saying about the women thing. Interestingly, <clears throat> by the way, women themselves seem to fall harder for this trick than men. So many women get, you know, the fake boobs or Botox injections or apply gaudy makeup, and none of this makes, like, makes them more beautiful. You know, you guys get it. I mean, but like, what, what, what is it in us that sort of finally wakes up the true sense, the true perception? How does one begin to recognize reality for himself when recognizing reality has been very, very nearly made illegal? You know, in the case of the beautiful woman, at least we have that the like sex instinct, at, at, you know, like sort of to um, filter out the bullcrap, right? I'm not sure that's true in a lot of other aspects of our lives that we're being lied to in. So the answer, as far as I can tell, in my 
limited experience seems to be trauma, I'm sorry to say. Those who have suffered enough generally begin to trust their own perception. And this is why people tend to say that wisdom comes from experience. It's not mere age, and it's not the kind of experience that's fun that gives rise to wisdom. You know, think back to Gilgamesh losing his best friend Enkidu. That was what sent him off looking for eternal life. I told you in the last episode that Ahab himself, quote, lay like dead for three days off the coast of Cape Horn, and he lost his leg in another incident. And it is because of this sort of pain, I suggest, that Ahab is able to make the claim I read to you in the last episode. Remember, quote, he says, All visible objects, man, are but as pasteboard masks. But in each event, in the living act, the undoubted deed, there, some unknown but still reasoning thing puts forth the moldings of its features from behind the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask. Are you getting this yet? Isn't it interesting, too, that the mask is like the symbol of our age now? Most people don't even realize the mask is a mask. They take visible objects as realities. But Ahab says, no, you know, dig deeper, go further. These are illusions. We want to know truth. And like, people hate on Ahab all the time, but like, I love this. I don't care what they say. I love this guy. Before I get to the story of Pip's trauma subsequent and his subsequent awakening, I want to mention a bit about Melville's follow-up novel, The Moby Dick. It's called Pierre. It's one of my favorite books, one you shouldn't read until after Moby Dick, so I understand that many of you won't get there. But Mother of Pearls, is, it is so fun and good. It's a scene in the book sort of right after Pierre receives the big psychological wound. I think he's like realizing that he's in love with his sister and some other stuff that's terrible and that his father was a bad guy or whatever. Just picture that, the big bad realization coming in the form of a letter. And so the text sort of shows him read the letter and then it says, <clears throat> I'm going to read to you a little here. I, Pierre, now indeed art thou hurt with a wound, never to be completely healed but in heaven. For thee... The before undistrusted moral beauty of the world is forever fled. For thee, thy sacred father is no more a saint. All brightness hath gone from thy hills, and all peace from thy plains. And now, now for the first time, Pierre, truth rolls a black billow through thy soul. Ah, uh, miserable thou to whom truth in her first tides bears nothing but wrecks. <clears throat> Still quoting, the perceptible forms of things, the shapes of thoughts, the pulses of life, but slowly came back to Pierre. And as the mariner, shipwrecked and cast on the beach, has much ado to escape the recoil of the wave that hurled him there, so Pierre long struggled and struggled to escape the recoil of that anguish which had dashed him out upon itself, or sorry, of itself upon the beach, his swoon. Still quoting, But man was not made to succumb to the villain woe. Youth is not young, and a wrestler is vain. Oh, sorry, youth is not young and a wrestler in vain. Pierre staggeringly rose to his feet, his wide eyes fixed, and his whole form in a tremble. Myself am left, at least, he slowly and half-chokingly murmured. With myself I front thee, unhand me all fears, and unlock me all spells. Henceforth I will know nothing but truth, glad truth or sad truth. I will know what is, and do what my deepest angel dictates. The letter, Isabel, sister, brother, me, me, my sacred father. This is some accursed dream, nay, but this paper thing is forged, a base and malicious forgery, I swear, and blah, blah, blah. He goes on about the letter. But, like, okay, here's a traumatized guy, and, you know, now he wants to cut through the bullcrap and get to the truth. See, like, okay, I mean, let me take a drink here. <laughs> Do you need a break? Pause it if you need a break. 
intellectually lazy halfwits love to say that Melville had no principles and he was gay and blah, blah, blah. But I don't know how you listen to this and the thing I just read and think some devil may care dandy could write this stuff. Pierre has suffered and so now he will not settle for falsehood. I gotta believe Melville, I mean, how does he write that unless he thinks like that at least sometimes? <clears throat> All right, back to Moby Dick. The character of Pip, the 13-year-old cabin boy of Captain Ahab, uh, he generally is just like a butler, doesn't do whale hunting himself. He just stays on the ship. It came to pass that Stubbs' after oarsman sprained his wrist. The way whaling worked, you had the big boat and then the four smaller boats along the, like, along the sides of it, and so when somebody spots the whale, the crew jumped into these smaller boats to give chase. And, you know, usually about six men and a harpooner on each boat. So one of these men got hurt, and they need the rowing power. So Stubb, the second mate, who gets, he's like the captain of one of these little boats, needed a replacement. So he drafts Pip in the service. Now, when you get a harpoon into a whale, and it's attached to the small boat by a rope, that rope was in the boat all coiled up. And so when it gets into the whale and the whale starts running, the line, which, which is what it's called, the line starts running. And it runs, you know, as fast as a whale can swim. So there's this coiled line all of a sudden now flying. And it freaks people out, especially, you know, 13-year-old first-timers. So Pip jumps from the boat. And there's a few funny times. It actually happens more than once. Pip jumps from the boat. He gets a warning. His guy says, don't jump from the boat, you know. But he does it again because he freaks out. And here's what it says. i got to read to you, you know, for three more minutes here. Now, in calm weather, to swim in the open ocean is as easy to the practiced swimmer as to ride in a spring carriage ashore. But the awful lonesomeness is intolerable. The intense concentration of self in the middle of such a heartless immensity. My God, who can tell it? Mark how, when sailors in a dead calm bathe in the open sea, mark how closely they hug their ship and only coast along her sides. But had Stubb really abandoned the poor little Negro to his fate? No, he did not mean to at least, because there were two boats in his wake, and he supposed, no doubt, that they would, of course, come up to Pip very quickly and pick him up. Though indeed such considerations towards oarsmen jeopardized uh, through their own timidity is not always manifested by the hunters in all similar instances. And such instances not unfrequently occur, almost invariably in the fishery a coward, so-called, is marked with the same ruthless detestation peculiar to military navies and armies. One more paragraph, here it goes. But it so happened that those boats, without seeing Pip, Suddenly spying whales close to them on one side turned and gave chase, and Stubb's boat was now so far away, and he and all his crew so intent upon his fish, that Pip's ringed horizon began to expand around him miserably. By the merest chance, the ship itself at last rescued him, but from that hour the little negro went about the deck an idiot, such at least they said he was. The sea had jeeringly kept his infinite bo or sorry, his finite body up, but drowned the infinite of his soul. Not drowned entirely, though. Rather, carried down alive to wondrous depths where strange shapes of the unwarped primal world glided to and fro before his passive eyes, and the miser merman wisdom revealed his hoarded heaps. And among the joyous, heartless, ever juvenile eternities, Pip saw the multitudinous god omnipresent coral insects that out of the firmament of waters heaved the colossal orbs. He saw God's foot upon the treadle of the loom and spoke it, and therefore his shipmates called him mad. So man's insanity is heaven's sense, and wandering from all mortal reason, man comes at last to that celestial thought, which to reason is absurd and frantic, and weal or woe feels then uncompromised, indifferent as his God. <sighs> of 
<laughs> wow. Okay, so I know that's a lot to take in. I want to slow you down and go over it a little, I guess. I mean, as much as I can. Let's, all, let's kind of do it in reverse order. We'll watch the effect that all this had on Pip and then like rewind to see how he got there. <clears throat> so, so let's come back to this scene where he almost drowns, the one I just read you. Before we look at that sequence in reverse, actually come with me six chapters forward to see how it all turns out for Pip. The chapter is called The Doubloon. And it is that famous chapter where Ishmael watches secretly as all the men pass by the doubloon which Ahab nailed to the mainmast. He first describes the doubloon with its image of three mountains and some birds and trees or whatever, and then he reports Ishmael does what the lookers are saying. The whole chapter is going to be another example of this problem of perspective, you know, same object giving rise to very different perceptions. So Ahab steps up and sees that all of the images on the coin are merely reflections of himself. The firm tower, that is Ahab. The volcano, that is Ahab. The courageous, the undaunted, and victorious fowl, that too is Ahab. All are Ahab. So the egomaniac sees himself. Then Starbuck walks by and says he sees something like the trinity in the coin. He's the Christian. He's going to see that in the coin. Stubb steps up and says he sees all manner of esoteric illusions in the coin to the Greek gods, the zodiac signs or whatever. And then Flask follows him and sees very little in the coin. He basically just sees it as money. He says he could buy 960 cigars with the doubloon. That's all. Now a few others pass and reflect on the meaning of the coin and then Pip arrives. Ishmael sees him coming and says, this way, Pip, poor boy, would he had died, or I. He's half horrible to me. He, too, has been watching all of these interpreters, myself included. And look now, he comes to read, and with that unearthly idiot face, stand away again and hear him, hark. And what does Pip see in the gold coin? This is what he says, quote, I look, you look, he looks, we look, ye look, they look. Ishmael can hardly believe it. He says, upon my soul, he's been studying Murray's grammar, improving his mind, poor fellow. He repeats his line a few times, and then basically to Ishmael's horror, he kind of gives us this, this insane sounding paragraph. I guess I'll read it to you. He says, Pip says, here's the ship's navel, this doubloon here, and they are all on fire to unscrew it. But unscrew your navel and what's the consequence? Then again, if it stays here, that is ugly too, for, aught when, sorry, for when aught's nailed to the mast, it's a sign that things grow desperate. Ha ha, old Ahab, the white whale, he'll nail ya. This is a pine tree. He's, you know, the main mast. My father in old Tolland country cut down a pine tree once and found a silver ring grown over in it, some old darkie's wedding ring. How did it get there? And so they'll say in the resurrection when they come to fish up this old mast and find a doubloon lodged in it with bedded oysters for the shaggy bark. Oh, the gold, the precious, precious gold, the green miser will hoard you soon. Hish, hish, God goes amongst the world blackberrying. Cook, ho, cook, and cook us. Jenny, hey, 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 Jenny, Jenny, and get your hoe cake done. I mean, that is maybe crazy. Okay, so... <clears throat> Now let's start the rewind. The end result is that Pip has become nearly incomprehensible to Ishmael and others on the boat. But interestingly, if we actually fast forward it instead of rewind, you would see from here on out in the book, the last 30 chapters or so, Ahab takes a particular liking to Pip, watches him closely, protects him from here on out. Ahab alone seems to understand Pip. That is to say, like the most powerful man on the ship has sympathy for the least among them, right? And perhaps he understands what happened to him. We see a Pip that is nearly out of his mind. He seems obsessed with perspective. Rewinding, we find that it was the great trauma of a near-death experience that seems to have sent him reeling like this. All alone, left behind in the middle of the ocean, 13 years old. Once he's retrieved, he goes about the deck an idiot. Or such, at least, they said he was. Pip, quote, saw God's foot upon the treadle of the loom and spoke it, and therefore his shipmates called him mad. Do you see that? He saw God and 
and this is a separate thing, and he spoke of it. And it is because he spoke of it that they called him mad. And again, rewinding, how did he get to see God? Suffering, nearly dying, you know. And for all that suffering, he was given this. Again, listen, the sea had jeeringly kept his finite body up, but drowned the infinite of his soul. Not drowned entirely, though. Rather, carried down alive to wondrous depths, where strange shapes of the unwarped primal world glided to and fro before his passive eyes, and the miser merman wisdom revealed his hoarded heaps. This all reminds me of the book of Job, of course, the greatest of all sufferers. Job was a good man, upright and God-fearing. But when the devil started smiting him, taking away his family, his possessions, and finally his health, making him endure the terrible skin boils, Job finally begins to demand an audience with God. He wants to see for himself. And after about 30 chapters of talking to himself, muttering, probably being thought an idiot like Pip, the Bible says God did come and speak to Job. And you can hear where the shift happens. It says in the Bible, I think this is chapter 42, like verse 7, I have heard of thee by hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. This is Job announcing that he has been, you know, born again. Nothing looks the same anymore. For he has now seen God. And really, like, what more of an answer or explanation could one desire, even for suffering? But again, by this suffering, he is given the revelation. Job is purified. I think the next verse says, Wherefore, you know, which is why, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So my argument in all of this is that Melville himself shows such a clear insight into how these non-ordinary states of consciousness, to use the secular materialist phrase, you know, these mystical states, how he's so, he's so good at describing how this works that it seems to me obvious that he knew them firsthand. Um, I've read at least one book that agrees with me, one by K. Redfield Jameson, which was called, um, I think, Mind on Fire, I think. Anyway, you can DM me if you're interested, concluded that um, Melville, she said, must have been manic depressive, which is, you know, modern psychobabble talk for a mystic. Don't forget that. She wasn't the first, actually, If I now that I keep reading here, or I remembered as I was writing. The very first biography of Melville, actually published in 1921, was by Raymond Weaver, and it was titled Herman Melville, Mariner and Mystic. Um, so, the, I mean, people recognize this. I'm not the only one. I'm just trying to, like, remind you of a kind, mostly weirdly forgotten aspect of Melville's writing. And actually, there's another one. Um, I'll just scholar post here for posterity's sake that uh, the book by, it was like a 1957 book by Lawrence Thompson called Melville's Quarrel with God. And he makes a big deal of what happened to Pip here too as like essentially a kind of spiritual, mystical conversion experience. Okay, you're going, if any of you, I mean, are keeping up at this point, like God bless you. For real, it's like amazing because this is just the, this is just a fire hose of content, isn't it? It's like it's amazing. Anyway, so here it is. Here's the thread that connects all these things I've been talking about. <clears throat> Melville understood that there are many layers one must go through to find capital T truth. But he did, I think, believe that people could finally catch glimpses under certain often incredibly difficult circumstances. In one of his letters, he wrote, quote, In this world of lies, truth is forced to fly like a scared white doe in the woodlands, and only by cunning glimpses will she reveal herself, as in Shakespeare and other masters of the great art of telling the truth, even though it be covertly and by snatches. So these who, you know, the, the people who see the truth itself must they must outstrip the official propaganda outlets and the phony accounts of truth they must swim out past the buoys that were put into place by institutional authority do you see that like that's how you like of course truth is hidden right 
Uh, and so in order to see it, you, there's a, I mean, this is the Plato's cave thing again, like, and it's institutional authorities that sort of set, set up the cave and put you in it when you were born. That's the idea here. <clears throat> there's a paragraph in Mardi, which I mentioned in a past episode, it was written in 1848, um, and it's similar to Moby Dick in that it's a bunch of sailors, but they're out there in the sea looking for, like, some goddess creature thing named Yila, I think. It's a, I mean, it's such an interesting book, but there's a, <clears throat> there's one scene in there I looked back through today where the guys are standing around talking about, I mean, basically, the book is just a sequence of visits to a bunch of different islands, and the islands pretty clearly represent the different nations of the world or different types of government or something like that. So it's kind of just an allegory. Um, <clears throat> but at one point they're talking about the, you know, the literature and the poets of these islands. And one of the islanders says this. So this is very, this is like sci-fi. Okay. This is like made up. So made up the names, it doesn't matter. You don't have to know the whole plot of the novel. In many points, the works of our great poet Vavona, you know, a poet on the island, now dead a thousand moons, still remain a mystery. Some call him a mystic, but wherein he seems obscure, it is perhaps we that are in fault. Not by premeditation spoke he those archangel thoughts, which made many declare that Bavona, after all, was but a crack-pated god, not a mortal full of sorry, not a mortal of sound mind. But had he been less, my lord, he had seemed more, saith Fulvi. Who then says, of the highest order of genius, it may be truly asserted that to gain the reputation of superior power, it must partially disguise itself. It must come down, and then it will be applauded for soaring. And furthermore, that there are those who falter in the common tongue because they think in another, and these are accounted stutterers and stammerers. Oh, that is so great. Man, do you need me to go over that again? Like, I will happily talk about that again. Maybe we'll do that on one of the private Patreon streams where we can just talk about this paragraph. But like, again, for he's I'm gonna summarize. But for the great, the greatest geniuses, this guy in the book says, to gain the reputation of superior power, the great genius has to partially disguise itself. It must come down, and then it will be applauded for soaring, because like the the intellectual plebs will almost feel like he's only a little smarter than them and they'll be like, wow, this guy's so smart. But like really he's a fucking genius and he can barely stand to be there with these idiots, right? Like that's the real, that's the idea. Man, what an amazing paragraph. To help you get what I'm saying here, also consider Hen Henry David Thoreau who says it, I think, clearer. He says, they who know of no purer sources of truth, who have traced up its stream no higher, stand and wisely stand by the Bible and the Constitution and drink at it there with reverence and humanity. But they who behold where it comes trickling into this lake or that pool, they gird up their loins once more and continue their pilgrimage toward its fountainhead. Okay? So he's saying, like, you know, if you want to know truth, like, you can look at the Bible and the Constitution. And that's good. Those are good, he says. But, like, there are people who want to know where, like, how did the truth get into the Constitution or the Bible? What's the source of it, right? And those people gird their loins and continue the pilgrimage toward its fountainhead, okay? I mean, Godward. Do you understand? This is what we seek on the Godward podcast. The fountainhead itself. I mentioned last episode that we would shift our focus to the Odyssey next. That still sounds good to me. To help us make the leap, I wanted to look real quick at um, one last set piece from Moby Dick, at least for now. People say they hate the cetology chapters, but I think it's because they haven't learned to think in analogies yet. So chapter 74 is called 
the sperm whale's head contrasted view. Now, if you haven't looked at a sperm whale's head recently, like, look at it. Look, I mean, behold the, the forehead of one of these sperm whales alone. <laughs> so in chapter 74, he's talking about this stuff, and he makes, I think, a tremendously interesting observation about the whale. And it's like a physiognom physiognomical or physiognomy-based assessment of the shape of the whale's head. And he's talking in particular about the eyes of the whale, which are set way back behind its huge forehead, necessarily producing these two divergent images. Do you, you follow me so far? Okay, so I'm just going to read to you this part, and then I'll say something about it. <clears throat> now, from this peculiar sideway position of the whale's eyes, it is plain that he can never see an object which is exactly a head, no more than he can one exactly a stern. In a word, the position of the whale's eyes corresponds to that of a man's ears, and you may fancy for yourself how it would fare with you did you sideways survey ob objects through your ears. You would find that you could only command some 30 degrees of vision in advance of the straight sideline of sight, and about 30 more behind it. If your bitterest foe were walking straight towards you, with dagger uplifted in broad day, you would not be able to see him, any more than if he were stealing upon you from behind. In a word, you would have two backs, so to speak, but at the same time also two fronts, side fronts. For what is it that makes the front of a man what indeed but his eyes? Now listen. <clears throat> Moreover, while in most other animals that I can now think of, the eyes are so planted as imperceptibly to blend their visual power so as to produce one picture and not two to the brain. The peculiar position of the whale's eyes, effectually divided as they are by many cubic feet of solid head, which towers between them like a great mountain separating two lakes in valleys, this, of course, must wholly separate the impressions which each independent organ imparts. The whale, therefore, must see one distinct picture on this side and another distinct picture on that side, while all between must be profound darkness and nothingness to him. Man may, in effect, be said to look out on the world from a sentry box with two joined sashes for his window. But with the whale, these two sashes are separately inserted, making two distinct windows, but sadly impairing the view. The pecu this peculiarity of the whale's eyes is a thing always to be borne in mind in the fishery and to be remembered by the reader in some subsequent scenes. Which, you know, he's referring to how the whale bashes the boat with his head. Now... Let's think about this. Why all this emphasis on the whale's eyes being set back and the two divergent images that, you know, who cares? Well, you can hear in that paragraph, he contrasts it with man and most animals whose, although they have two eyes, it produces one visual image in the mind. You're only seeing this right now if you're watching on YouTube and nothing else. There's not like another like background behind you, right? So that is kind of mind-blowing. Like what, like, what is even going on in the whale's head, right? It has two worldviews. Now, in the next episode, I'm going to give you a little bit of a setup for the Odyssey, but I'm going to assume most of you endured some teacher summarizing the whole thing for you, and so I won't. Even though it's one of my favorite books, I just, I can't, I don't want to do like eight episodes on the Odyssey to follow up, you know, four of them on Moby Dick. <laughs> So I'm just going to do one episode on, um, I think I'm pretty sure it's book nine, which is where, and like I'll do all of book nine, but I want to focus on the scene with the um, encounter with the Cyclops. And what we're going to talk about is the contrast between the Cyclops and his one eye and this Moby Dick, this whale, with its two separate eyes looking out on separate things in the world, right? And I'm going to show you, I mean, I think pretty clearly that... Even Homer does this, like Homer's description of the one-eyed Cyclops. Just like I'm saying this one about Moby Dick is more than just like 
a throwaway chapter that's boring. When, like, no, it's like that's a symbol of something, and it's going to teach us about sort of two different, like, two different ontologies, two different ways of being in the world. One of them, the you know, monomaniacal, the single-eyed. I'm thinking of Matthew six twenty-two. I'll come back to that in the next episode. That's one way of living where you have one eye and that's it. You see one image. But the other way, the way the whale does it, you have multiple worldviews in your head. You can you have negative capability, right? That's what that seems to me to be what Melville sort of imparts to the or like is that the right word? Im, imputes to the whale like this kind of double consciousness that you know. I think stupidly. W.E.B. Du Bois seems to get credit for having invented, or, right? But really, I mean, he's getting it from earlier thinkers, including the likes of Melville, who understood in the mid 19th century that there are people who have like dual consciousnesses, you know, and maybe multiple consciousnesses. And it's because they're trying to communicate with essentially, what does he call them there? The crowd, right? The normies, basically. And so, you know, you have to, if you want to succeed with them, you have to come down to their level and you have to stutter and stammer a little bit and use their stupid language so that maybe they can catch a glimpse of the high things that you want to try to communicate to them with, you know? So that's, uh, that's maybe where we're going in the next episode. I think you guys will, I think you guys will manage, um, I also, let's see, I just, to myself, I have two minutes left. I wanted to say, so we're going to do Notes from the Underground very soon. We're going to do, as I said, The Odyssey in the next episode. Probably get to Dante pretty soon. I got at least three episodes on Dante I got to do. <sighs> you guys know the stuff, right? Join me on Twitter. The party seems to be popping today. Somebody said I need, like, a co-host. I don't know. Um, maybe, like, I would probably do guest interviews or something that would be fun um maybe i'll make that the ten dollar tier on patreon or something and uh oh speaking of patreon i think this friday if, you, if you're watching if you're paying me five bucks a month i hope you're watching probably this friday we'll try to get together at like what 10 or 9 30 or something and just shoot the shit for 90 minutes or so and see if like i basically want to do with the patrons just do special time, like whatever you guys want to talk about. If you have like recommendations or like follow up questions to any of this stuff, or like, or if you think I'm dumb, and I mean that's fine too. Just tell me privately, whatever. You guys are the greatest. Um, here's the outro music. Thanks for stopping by again. <laughs>